cocaine um, becoming invisible and in sentence. And the other milestone year is 1961. This is the year of the Global Single Convention of the UN, which finally puts coca uh, prohibited on, on the global um, agenda. The first convened U.S. Pan-American Cocaine Police Summits and the adoption of these anti-drug campaigns in Bolivia. Now, obviously, the kind of cause and effect here is hard to prove, but illicit cocaine visibly ramps up right after each of these repressive conjunctures of 1948 and 1961. The second related point of analysis, <coughs> this illicit movement was structured and canalized by um, the political struggles around escalating Cold War tensions in Latin America. That is, cocaine was a kind of stepchild of the Cold War, um, which I think of as a quite different type of political thesis than the innumerable kind of conspiracy theorists of drug epidemics. Um, variously, some of you may be familiar with these. You know, there are people who blame the CIA. CIA caused all our drug problems. Uh, at the time, in the 1940s through the 1960s, the culprit was always the communists. It's a communist conspiracy drugs. And then, of course, there's the official conspiracy theory of the DEA, the US government, the cartels are the ones who are responsible for US drug problems, right? This is a very different type of political explanation. Now, in a kind of simplified version of this scheme, 1947, the Cold War is born and exported to Latin America, and so was born illicit cocaine. In the process, I think, of bringing Andean states in as US allies against communist phantoms and into Trump-dumped anti-narcotics crusades at the same time, there's a very dramatic coincidence of this in Peru. The new anti-communist campaign of General Odria's right-wing military, he was repressing a left-wing political party called the Opera, became closely mixed up with the novel pro-US war against local Amazonian cocaine. In 1952, the Bolivian Revolution opens this decade-long struggle between the left-wing nationalists and a meddling United States and destroys a traditional state and social order. And so not coincidentally becomes this cradle force of, ooh, that's a big metaphor, of illicit cocaine. 1959 to 1961, a historic Cold War turning point was the Cuban Revolution, the Cold War climax in Latin America. Um, Contrary to the propaganda at the time, Fidel quickly cleansed Cuba of mafia, including these nascent cliques of cocaine capitalists, and their expulsion across the Americas defined this truly internationalist career class of cocaine um, traffickers focused on Bolivia's source of coca. Now, by the mid-1960s, you see a series of Cold War-inspired dictatorships in places like Brazil and Argentina. And the effect of these was to close the freewheeling drug corridors of the early post-war period. Um, uh, and so the exports of this now bustling, by the mid-1960s, the exports of this now bustling illicit drug, although it was still kind of secret from US public, um, it was kind of covert, the drug became concentrated in just one country, Chile. Um, so 1973, and this is virtually unknown, is the decisive climax of this whole process, which rapidly shifts the entire um, scene of action to Colombia. And that is the September 1973, 11th September, right? Same date. 1973 um, coup of General Augusto Pinochet, infamously sponsored by those fanatical anti-communists Nixon and Kissinger, radically displaced cocaine routing north, right into the hands of this new and daring class of Colombians like Pablo Escobar and Carlos uh, Leyva. So this was overall the political geography of the newborn commodity illicit cocaine, midwived by these larger post-war political movements anti-drug movements, 
and anti-communist movements. And if the United States definitively triumphed in the Cold War in Latin America and elsewhere, these actions paradoxically birthed a continuing unwinnable drug war, a little bit like today's kindred war on terror, a global war without end. So that's my end.